Okay, a disclaimer here at the start. I'm in desperate need of a haircut, so excuse me if I'm constantly brushing my fringe out of my eyes. It is spring now here in the northern hemisphere. It is meteorological spring. It is astrological spring. We are fully in spring. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of my spring anticipated releases. I'm a little giddy at the moment. Um, I am back filming for the first time in like five weeks because I was in Peru for three weeks. Um, I was preparing for Peru and I um then got tonsillitis as soon as I landed and I sounded like Kermit the Frog um, so it was not really possible for me to film uh, but now as you can tell I'm back there will be Peru vlogs I don't know if they've already started going up but um, this video is not that this is my spring anticipated releases books that I'm excited about that are coming out in April May and June this year very exciting very soon um, I'm not sure if some of these may have already come out as usual I will not tell you the dates in the video because I will not remember but I will have them listed in date order with the dates in the description so if you need to know that there it is it's there you can know um, and also how do I find these? I know a lot of people are interested to know how people discover some of their anticipated releases. Uh, for me, I used to use a website that no longer functions. So I will, again, in the description, loads of stuff in this description, I will put the articles and the bookstagrammers who did the research for me <laughs> so that I could then talk to you as if um, I have any knowledge of the publishing world. So those will all be in the description. I have 18 books plus some short story collections to talk to you about. So 18 novels and some short story collections. I don't tend to do non-fiction here um, but if you would like some non-fiction releases for the second half of the year or something let me know in the comments. I will think about that. So without further ado uh, let's get this chaos on the road. The first on my list is The Five Sorrowful Mysteries of Andy Africa by Stephen Buoro. This is a debut novel that has been praised by Camilla Shamley and Max Porter and No Violet Bulaway and I loved Glory when I read it last year um, and it was on a list of um, 61 anticipated African releases by brittlepaper.com which is a blog that talks all about African literature and as you know if you've been on my channel for a while I tend to read a fair amount of African literature. Um, I'm definitely interested in the kind of books that come out of the African continent uh, into UK. Obviously it's a big continent but I think a lot of what releases gets released is has, has uh, is talking to each other, it's in dialogue with each other in some ways. 15 year old Andrew Aziza lives in Kontogora, Nigeria where his days are spent around town with his droogs Slim and Morocco grappling with his fantasies about white girls especially blondes and wondering who his father is. When he's not at church, at school, or attempting to form Africa's first superheroes, he obsesses over mathematical theorems, ideas of black power, and HXVX, the curse of Africa. Sure enough, the reluctantly nicknamed Andy Africa soon falls hopelessly and inappropriate in love with his first white girl he lays eyes on, Eileen. But at the church party held to celebrate her arrival, multiple crises loom. An unfamiliar man claims, despite his mother's denials, to be Andy's father, and the gathering of an anti-Christian mob is headed for the church, both set to shake the foundations of everything Andy knows and loves. Um, I'm sorry, I will be reading the descriptions for these because I don't know them well enough to talk about them off the cuff. This sounds like it's going to have some clockwork orange influences, and I say that because he calls his friends droogs, which is obviously what they call each other in clockwork orange. Um, although it is from droog, which is the Russian from friend, so maybe there will be a influence of Russia in this book as well? I don't know. I think it's probably Clockwork Orange. Uh, the next one is Azukar by Ni Aikwe Pa. Azukar is a novel about belonging in a world where things are on the move. People, ideas, foods, and not least, music. Oswald Kohli Osabute Jr., henceforth Junior, leaves his family in Accra to travel to the mythical Caribbean island of Fumaz, where the revolutionary philosophy of peopleism just about keeps its flame alive against the forces of an old-style command centre political bureaucracy and a stifling trade blockade from the big imperious neighbour to the north. Junior brings the knowledge of the scientist, the skills of a farmer and the heart of an invention of a musician to his life in Fumaz. As scientist, he must find some way of rescuing the island's famed sweet rice industry from collapse. As a farmer, he sees how much of the West African food has journeyed across the Atlantic to make the island's unique cuisine. As a musician, he becomes part of the spirit that puts the island on the world stage, out of all proportion to its size. This sounds really interesting. Um, reminds me in terms of the fact that it's like an imaginary country and 
doing a lot of like political analysis based on an imaginary country of How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbue which was about um which was about like extractivism in Africa and this is about um the transatlantic trade um and the transatlantic slave trade and the effect that had on culture so I'm excited to see how it works out in this in, in this book. Up uh, next on my list is one that I have talked about before, which is Cursed Bread by Sophie McIntosh. And I talked about it in my Predicting the Women's Prize long list, which you can watch if you want. And this one actually did make it onto the Women's Prize long list. It was one of the few that I got right. But Sophie McIntosh wrote uh, The Water Cure, which was very well praised, and I was interested in reading that one. Um, and so when this one came out, I became intrigued by it as well for, for that reason. And it's also um, a a uh, queer love story between women, which I'm trying to read more of. Elodie is the baker's wife, a plain, unremarkable woman ignored by her husband and underestimated by her neighbours. She burns with the secret desire to be extraordinary. One day, a charismatic new couple appear in town, the ambassador and his sharp-toothed wife, Violet, and Elodie quickly falls under their spell. All summer long, she stalks them through the shining streets, inviting herself into their home, eavesdropping on their coded conversations, longing to be part of their world. Meanwhile, beneath the tranquil surface of daily life, strange things are happening. Six horses are found dead in a sun-drenched field, laid out neatly on the ground like an offering. Widows see their lost husbands walking up the moonlit river, coming back to claim them. A teenage boy throws himself into the, midsummer, into the bonfire at the midsummer feast. A dark intoxication is spreading through the town, when en and when Elodie finally understands her role in it, will it be too late to stop? It sounds almost like it's historical, or maybe a kind of fairy tale, mythical kind of vibe. I can't really tell. It doesn't say anywhere that it is historical, but the descriptions of like throwing yourself into the bonfire at the midsummer feast feels mystical to me. It's an LGBTQ mystery, is what it's been classified as. Um, so. Who knows? I am excited to read that. I love like dark, weird, possibly historical, maybe fantastical books. One that's been described as similar to Shucky Bane, which is a book that I haven't read but have been interested, is Juno Loves Legs by Carl Geary. And this is, and Carl Geary I think is an Irish author, another thing I've been meaning to read more of. Juno loves Legs. She's loved him since their first encounter at school in Dublin, where she fought the playground bullies for him. He feels brave with her. She feels safe with him and together they feel invincible, even if the world has other ideas. The two find their way from the back street of the city's pubs to, the, to its underground parties and squats, where, on the verge of adulthood, they find a breathing space to begin their real lives. Only Legs might be taking him somewhere Juno can't follow. Set during the political and social unrest of the 80s, as families struggled to survive and their children struggled to be free, this beautiful, vivid novel of childhood friendship is about being young, being hurt, being seen and being loved. So, as I said, I'm meaning to read more Irish fiction. I love a coming-of-age story. The next one on my list is um, The Last Animal by Ramona Altabelle. I can't remember why I put this on this list. Let's have a look. Teenage sisters Eve and Vera never imagined their summer vacation would be spent in the Arctic, tanging along their mother's scientific expedition. That's why. I love books set in remote, isolated locations. But there's a lot about their lives lately that hasn't been going as planned, and truth be told, a single mother might not be happy either. Now in Siberia, with a bunch of serious biologists, even Vera are just bored enough to cause trouble. Fooling around in the permafrost, they accidentally discover a perfectly preserved 4,000-year-old baby mammoth, and things finally start to get interesting. The discovery sets off a surprising chain of events, leading mothers and daughters to go rogue, piping from the slopes of Siberia to the shores of Iceland to an exotic animal farm in Italy, resulting in the birth of a creature that could change the world, or at least this family. So that sounds bizarre, um, slightly strange. I'm not hugely into science books necessarily, but um, I am intrigued by the bizarre, um, which that sounds like it will be. One of my favourite books that I read last year was The Vegetarian by Han Kang, and this year she's coming out with another book, Greek Lessons, which I think is also translated by Deborah Smith, who translated her other works. And so I'm really excited to read another novel from her. In a classroom in Seoul, a young woman watches her Greek language teacher at the blackboard. She tries to speak but has lost her voice. Her teacher finds himself drawn to the silent woman, for day by day he is losing his sight. Soon they discover that a deeper pain binds them together. For her, in the space of just a few months, she has lost both her mother and the custody battle for her nine-year-old son. For him, it's the pain of growing up between Korea and Germany, being torn between two cultures and two la languages. It tells the story of two ordinary people brought together at a moment of private anguish, the fading light of a man losing his vision, meeting the silence of a woman who has lost her language. Yet these are the two things that draw them to one another, 
Slowly the two discover a profound sense of unity, their voices intersecting with startling beauty as they move from darkness to light, from silence to expression. So as I said, I love Han Kang's writing, um, so I want to read it for that reason alone. Um, I know this will hopefully be quite dark and strange and very much focused on ideas. It sounds very much more whimsical, not whimsical, but melancholy um, than The Vegetarian, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that from her. Next we have The Covenant of Water by Abraham Vigazi. And this one's been named by as an anticipated release by a lot of different publications, but I think I was intrigued by the synopsis. It is another historical fiction and kind of a historical epic set between 1900 and 1977. And I do often quite enjoy these, um, particular ones I can think of as like The Old Drift by Namwali Sapal. Following a family in southern India that suffers from a peculiar affliction. In every generation, at least one person dies by drowning. And in Kerala, water is everywhere. Okay, that alone is enough to make me fascinated by this book. A Strange Family Curse um, set in Kerala in India. Yeah, definitely intrigued. At the turn of the century, a 12-year-old girl, grieving the death of her father, is sent by boat to her wedding, where she will meet her 40-year-old husband for the first time. From this poignant beginning, the young girl and future matriarch, known as Bigamachi, will witness unthinkable changes of home and at large over the span of her extraordinary life, full of the joys and trials of love and the struggles of heart. So yeah, I don't know anything about Abraham Vergozzi, although I don't think this is his first novel. A book by a writer that I haven't read before, although I do think I have a book of his on my shelves, um, Shy by Max Porter. He's a writer that a lot of people that I have similar tastes to here on booktube have raved about, and so I definitely want to give his writing a go. I saw a title for a review of it, I didn't read the review, that says um, he, he's Max Porter is still very weird, um, and I, I love a weird experimental book. This is a story of a strange, of a few strange hours in the life of a troubled teenage boy. He is wandering into the night, listening to the voices in his head, his teachers, his parents, the people he has hurt and the people who are trying to love him. He is escaping last chance, a home for very disturbed young men, walking into the haunted space between his night terrors, his past and the heavy questions of his future. Oh, I think it's going to be quite a short and experimental book. I think that's mostly what Max Porter does and I'm definitely here for that. Next on my list is Kairos by Jenny Erpenbeck, and I kind of love this cover. This one is set in Berlin in the 1980s, around the fall of um, the, the Berlin Wall, uh, which is another period of interest, I, another period of history about which I don't know very much, but I'm definitely intrigued to know more. Berlin, 11th of July 1986. They, met, they meet by chance on a bus. She is a young student. He is older and married. Theirs is an intense and sudden attraction. Fueled by a shared passion for music and art, and heightened by the secrecy they must maintain. But when she strays for a single night, he cannot forgive her, and a dangerous crack forms between them, opening up a space for cruelty, punishment, and the exertion of power. As the world around them is changing too, as the GDR begins to crumble, so too do all the old uncertainties and the old loyalties, ushering a new era whose great gains also involve a profound loss. Sounds super interesting. Um, I love kind of the breakdown of a relationship, a very close intimate look at a relationship like that. I read Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller, I think it was last year um, that it was shortlisted for the Women's Prize and this year she has another book out which is The Memory of Animals. Um, so I, I enjoyed her writing last year, Unsettled Ground didn't completely work for me but I definitely enjoyed it and so I'm looking forward to reading another book from her. Nephi is a young woman running away from grief and guilt and the one big mistake that has derailed her career. When she answers the call of a volunteer in a controlled vaccine trial, it offers her a way to pay off her many debts and perhaps to make up for the past. But when the London streets below her window fall silent and all external communications cease, only Nephi and four other volunteers remain in the unit. With food running out and a growing sense that the stranger she is may with may be holding back secrets, Nephi has questions that no one can answer. So it sounds like it is going to be a Covid novel, um, a pandemic novel, which I haven't read a huge amount of, um, but it's being described as compulsively readable, a literary page turner, um, and I think I need more literary page turners in my life this year. Another one I think sounds like it could be a fun romp is Madalena and the Dark by Julia Fine. I really love the cover of this one as well. And it's also set in Venice, which is such a romantic city to have a story set in, and it's set in the 18th century, which I've already said is a historical fiction time period about which I'm interested in reading about. This one has a magical touch too, which used to be my bread and butter, like slightly magical historical fiction was my favourite genre to read. Um, so I'm thinking about dipping my toe back 
written that this year. Venice, 1717. Before Maddalena arrived at the Ospedale della Pieta, Venice's most illustrious music school, 15-year-old orphan Luisa has only wanted to do one thing, to be the best at violin. Luisa is good at violin, but she is not the best. She has her peers, but she does not have friends, until Maddalena. Sent to the Pieta until her noble family can find her husband, Madalena is cunning, passionate and unlike anyone Luisa has ever met. Madalena can promise the world to Luisa, and when she does, their fates intertwine. But Madalena has made a dangerous wager, and for both girls there will be an unimaginable price to pay. A sweeping, dark fairy tale about the violent hearts of teenage girls. So it sounds like it's going to be wonderfully gothic um, and I look forward to seeing what other people have to say about that one because it could go either way, I think, for me. Next on my list is I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home by Laurie Moore. I haven't read any Laurie Moore but she is an author that I've heard the name of a lot. I think, generally speaking, she's more well known for short stories but I think this one is a novel. That's the, the vibe I'm getting anyway. I might be entirely off base. But The Guardian describes her as America's first lady of darkness and mirth and dark humour is definitely something I love in my book. High up in a New York City hospice, Finn sits with his beloved brother Max who is slipping from one world to the next. But when a phone call summons Finn back to the troubled old flame, a strange journey begins, opening a, opening a trapdoor in reality. It will prompt a questioning of life and death, grief and the past, comedy and tragedy and the diaphanous separations that lie between them all. Now if you know, I've talked on this channel a lot how I like a ghost story and particularly when it's dealing with grief and the things that haunt us. So I think this story sounds maybe not ghosts, but definitely grief and hauntings and the things that um, preoccupy us, I suppose. And a trapdoor in reality as well sounds wonderfully whimsical and my stuff. Next is Of Cattle and Men by Anna Paula Meyer. Um, and this is a Charco Press title. And I think Charco Press published books from Latin America um, specifically. So this is that and obviously the title evokes of mice and men um so i think there might be that uh, a reference to that in a landscape worthy of cormac mccarthy the river runs septic and sludge you with blood edgar wilson makes the sign of the cross on the forehead of a cow then stuns it with a mallet he does this over and over and over again the stun operator at mr milo's slaughterhouse reliable responsible quietly dispatching cows and following orders wherever they may take him it's important to calm the cows especially now they seem so unsettled one runs headlong into the side of a barn, 22 more hurl themselves off the side of a cliff. Bronco Gill, their foreman, thinks it's a jaguar or a wild boar. Edgar Wilson does not. But what is certain is there's something driving, there's something in this desolate corner of Brazil driving men and animals to murder and madness. So, isolated locations, um, darkness, um, and something psychological going on um, and also it sounds like it might be slightly political um, something to do with cattle ranching in Brazil um, I feel like there might be political overtones in this one so um, I've been meaning to read more Latin American fiction um, although does Brazil count as Latin America it's not Hispanic America because it's Lucifer so I don't know Next on my list is another one by an author that I've heard a lot about for another book um, and been meaning to read that one so the new book is also intriguing to me. And this is Dust Child by Wen Fan K Mai who also wrote The Mountain Sing which is one that I've heard a lot of people praise over on Bookstagram um, and I also am interested in reading more books set in Vietnam, it's a country that I really love. Trang and Kun are sisters who leave their rural village for the bustling city of Saigon, desperate to find work and help their impoverished parents. When they take jobs as bar girls, paid to flirt with the American GIs, they must decide whether they are willing to turn their backs on the people they used to be. Fong, one of thousands of mixed-race children abandoned by their American fathers and Vietnamese mothers, Fong grows up surrounded by rejection, insulted as the black American imperialist and the child of his enemy, but he never gives up hope of finding his parents and proving that he is more than a bu doi, more than the dust of life. Dan, a former American helicopter pilot, plagued by regrets about his actions during the Vietnam War. Now he has returned in the hope of confronting the demons that refuse to fall silent. Set between the Vietnam War and the present day, Dust Child is a sweeping epic of family secrets, hidden heartache from an internationally celebrated author. Uh, the Vietnam War is definitely something I want to learn more about, read more about. I think I've only read The Sympathizer, which is set in the aftermath and a lot more in America, although it does go back to Vietnam and talk about the war in Vietnam as well. I don't think I've read anything else set during that time period, um, but the War Remnants Museum in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, is the best museum I've ever been to um, and so it's definitely a period of history that I'm interested in reading about. 
And then the last one is one that's actually a classic, but it's being published in English translation, I think for the first time, by Fitz Corraldo. Um, and, and that is Macu Neymar by Mario de Andrade, who is an, a Brazilian writer. The, this landmark novel from 1928 has been hugely influential. It follows the adventures of the shape-shifting Macu Neymar and his brothers as they leave their home in the northern Amazon for a whirlwind tour of Brazil, cramming four centuries and a continental expanse into a single mythic plane. Having lost a magic amulet, the hero and his brothers journey to Sao Paulo to retrieve the talisman that has fallen into the hands of an Italo-Peruvian captain of industry, who is also a cannibal giant. Written over six delirious days, the fruit of years of study, Macu Neymar magically synthesises dialect, folklore, anthropology, mythology, flora, fauna and pop culture to examine Bra uh, Brazilian identity. This translation by Katrina Dodson has been many years in the making and includes an extensive section of notes providing essential background information. Um, so, as I've said before, epic historical fiction, myths weaved with history, all that sort of thing are really interesting to me um, and also reading more South American fiction. It does give me 100 years of solitude vibes in terms of that like putting 400 years of history into one mythic plane um that does remind me of 100 years of solitude although this book is 40 years previous to that so the last four on my list are collections of short stories that i um, was also intrigued by um i've definitely been reading more short stories uh, over the past few years and that is something that i want to continue um and these ones have intrigued me very much the first one is butter by gail jones and i believe that gail jones is a very well-known short story writer from america the collection has been praised by tayari jones and uh disha filio who are both very well-known writers gail jones long career began with her blistering 1975 debut Corrigidora, which was edited by Toni Morrison, and she is increasingly recognised as one of the greatest literary writers of the 20th century. Jones's unique talents are displayed in a range of settings and styles, from the hyper-realist to the mystical, in novella-length stories, intricate multi-part narratives, and compelling fragments. So it's hard, obviously, to describe um, a collection of short stories because there's not a um, through line plot uh, so that as you would describe a novel um, but she's so well known and so praised as a short story writer that I definitely want to give this one a go. The next one is an anthology so lots of different authors in there and this is No Edges Swahili Stories and I think it's the first piece of literature to be translated from Swahili into English um, and as I said earlier I really enjoy reading African fiction that's the, the African fiction that ends up in the UK is stuff that I have found very compelling and interestingly written in the past um, and so yeah a collection of short stories from lots of different writers I don't know I think will be very interesting. No Edges introduces eight East African writers from Tanzania and Kenya as they share tales of sorcerers, Nairobi junkyards, cross-country bus rides and spaceships that blast prisoners into eternity. Here we are encouraged to explore the chaos of life on a crowded earth as well as the otherworldly realms lying just beyond our reach. Through language bursting with rhythm and vivid African futurist visions these writers summon the boundless future into being. So it might not be, generally speaking, my style, um, but I'm definitely excited. The three authors I can see listed here are Lusaje Makwendi Israel, Euphrazi Keza Lahabi, and Mwas Mahuku. I apologise for any incorrect pronunciations there. Another one coming out by Charco Press is Fresh Dirt from the Grave by Giovanna Rivero. In Fresh Dirt from the Grave, a hillside is an emerald saddle teeming with evil and beauty is this collision of harshness and tenderness that animates Giv Giovanna Rivero's short stories, where no degree of darkness can take away from the gentleness she shows all violated creatures. A mad aunt haunts her family, two Bolivian children are left in the outskirts of a Meti reservation outside of Winnipeg, a widow teaches origami in a woman's prison and murders, house fires and poisonings abound, and so does the persistent bravery of the people trying to forge ahead in the face of the world. They are offered cruelty, often indifference at best, and yet they keep going. Rivera has reworked the boundaries of the Gothic to engage with pre-Columbian ritual, folk tales, sci-fi and eroticism, and found the world in the wound, their humanity and the possibility of hope. So as I said earlier, I love dark stories um, and the Gothic, uh, as this mentions, and also when kind of classic Western genres like the Gothic can be interwoven with, as it says here, pre-Columbian ritual and folk tale. Um, so that sounds really interesting. And I am hoping I will get 
to read it. The final book on my list is 19 Claws and a Blackbird by Augustina Bezterica, who wrote Tender is the Flesh, which is a cannibalism book that I haven't read, but I know a lot of people have praised, and it is that weird dark fiction that I love, and also this is translated from the Spanish, this is more Latin American fiction. In these tense, macabre stories, bodies fall from the sky, perfect nails conceal grisly secrets, and violence pulses behind gleaming facades. From hellish visions to obsessive relationships, acclaimed author Agustina Basterica takes us to the dark heart of human desires and fears. Shocking, brutal, yet glinting with sharp humour, Nineteen Claws and a Blackbird is a breathtaking dive into human monstrousness from a master of contemporary horror. So as I said, I've been reading more horror recently, uh, literary horror in particular, so I am... I am intrigued to start that one and as I also said that was the last book on my list. So I hope you have found something new to intrigue you in this list. If there are any books coming out in April, May or June about which you are excited that I have not mentioned here please do let me know in the comments. I would love to see what else is coming out that I can get excited about. And thank you for watching. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe. I put out new videos twice a week for the most part so I will see you again very soon. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.